has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, praise his holy name. To whom all blessings flow, we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Oh, good evening out there in Facebook and YouTube land. We are uh, doing the last seven sins of Jesus. And they're going to be coming in the order uh, as uh, Evangelist Urban from Luke 23, 34, then Reverend Goodman, Luke 23, 43, Evangelist Richmond, uh, John 19, 26, 27, and Reverend Jenkins, Matthew 26, 46, and Prophet Squawwell will be coming from John 19, 28, and Reverend Richmond, John 19, 30, and Reverend McCoy is Luke 23, 46. Amen. Praise his holy name. Reverend uh, Urban, come on and let the Lord use you. that 
that we might be redeemed and receive salvation in order to be saved. And as a result of his prayer and plea from the cross, God the Father did honor his prayer by opening up the ways for redemption and salvation to all who believe in his son, Jesus Christ. And scripture says that the story of redemption, it doesn't end nor does it start there. On the old rugged cross on Golgotha's hill where he hanged for approximately six hours. You see, his cry for forgiveness goes all the way back to the Old Testament. When God had a plan for Jesus Christ, his only son, to fulfill his promises of redemption for mankind after the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Scripture says in Genesis 3 and 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed that it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. You see, as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, there became separation between God and mankind, causing the curse of sin and death to enter into the world. And as a result of this treasonous act done in the garden by Adam, Eve, and the snake, this led to disobedience to the Holy God. And as a result, in, it caused sin and death to enter into the world. As a result, the cause caused God to curse the entire human race because of the anger and wrath he had towards Adam because of his failure to lead and act as a leader for the people. And in addition to his anger and wrath towards man, God went a step further to curse the grounds and to curse those who were living off the grounds, which was Adam and Eve. And God said in Genesis 3, 17, that the ground shall be cursed for thy sake, and sorrow shall thy eat of it all the days of thy life. You see, Prior to this incident, God, Adam, and Eve had a loving relationship. They would fellowship and commune in the garden all together. But after they chose to disobey God and listen to the snake by eating the, from the forbidden tree, this relationship was broken. Then separation came between them. You see, there was no more of them fellowshipping in the garden anymore. God's wrath was against man, meaning God became angry with mankind, causing the penalty of sin and death to fall on all of us. Then God put Adam, Eve, and the snake out of the garden. Scripture says in Genesis 23, Therefore the Lord God sent them from forth from the garden of Eden. Now, doesn't this sound a lot like modern day parents? After they get fed up with their disobedient children, they put them out of the house because they don't want to abide by the rules. But unlike God being more forgiving than man, he did not want to totally get rid of the relationship that he had with his creation. You see, God wanted to make up and reconcile with them with this broken relationship. But before this could happen, someone had to satisfy God's wrath and anger that he had against mankind by the way of redemption 
it had to be a redemption plan put in place which would remove the curses of sin and death. Due to Adam, Eve, and the snake's disobedient act that took place. So God tried a second time to attempt to redeem mankind by using his chosen people, the Israelites. So God chose them and asked them to go and tell the nations that they need to turn their back on sin and to obey him. But the Israelites, they couldn't do it because they too started to serve other gods. They started to serve the gods with which God had forbid. But the Israelites, like we said, they, they couldn't do it. Therefore, God says that I will decide that I will use them with Noah. Noah on the other side of the flood. But just like the Israelites, Noah couldn't do it. Noah was a drunk. So God could not use Noah. As scripture said in Genesis, 9, 20 to 21, and Noah became, began to be a hus um, husband, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and there was drunk within his tent. This act caused a bad influence on his family. Therefore, they too couldn't do it. Then God tried Father Abraham. And scripture said in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and I will bless thee, and I will bless thy people. But Father Abraham couldn't do it, because he was a liar. You see, twice Father Abraham lied and said that Sarah was his sister, and was not his wife. This can be found in Genesis 12, 10 through 20, and in Genesis 21 through 16. And as a result of these lies, just like their father, his descendants couldn't do it. Because they failed to keep the covenant God made with their father, Abraham, in the land of Canaan. You see, they too turned their backs on God and was living adulterous and sinful lives with the Canaanite people and started to worship their gods, which was forbidden. When God saw that man couldn't be redeemed through mankind, after, he re after the repeated failure of trying to save man through man, God saw that it couldn't happen because we all fail and are sinners due to the curse, the curses of sin and death that took place in the Garden of Eden. Then God decided he would do it himself by giving us the Mosaic Law, which he wrote out with his own hands called the Ten Commandments. Then he gave it to Moses for us to live by. Scripture said in Exodus 31 and 18, and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communion with him on Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony of tablet stones written with his fingers of God. But the law couldn't do it because people would not keep the law nor abide by it. Scripture said in Deuteronomy 27, 16, curse be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say amen. Finally, again, God saw that mankind couldn't be saved, couldn't be saved nor redeemed by man. Nor would they follow the laws he wrote down for us. Therefore, he said, I will redeem mankind through my suffering servant, my son, Jesus Christ and I will write the law on their hearts with a new covenant. Scripture says in Jeremiah 31, 33, and that day when God comes to establish his kingdom, this is what will happen. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts 
and I will be their gods and they will be my people. He was referring to at that time the Holy Spirit that would come and live in us. And scripture says in Isaiah 53, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. And scripture says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God did finally and fully de defeat Satan by destroying the curses of sin and death by sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to the cross to redeem mankind back to him. You see, Jesus did it all by hanging on the cross, died as he as he hung between two thieves, but he was taken down and buried in a rich man's tomb. Mm -hmm. Then out of the, on the third day, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 15 and 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. And John 11, 25 says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, he shall be, he shall live. But the story doesn't stop there. You see, God and Jesus had to send for another God to live within us so that we can have the power to live by God's rules and to turn our backs on sin. They call him in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter and the third verse, the spirit of the living God. And John 14 and 17, the spirit of truth. Isaiah 11 and 2 calls him the spirit of knowledge. Scripture says in John 14 and 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And John 14, 26 says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, but I have a few names for him myself. I call him my mind regulator because had, not, had God not stayed with me in many situations I have gone through, I would have lost my mind. I call him my Prince of Peace. Because still what I go through, I still have peace that surpasses all understanding. I also call him my BFF, my best friend forever, because he has never walked out on me, but my so-called friends who could never be found when I needed them the most. You see, Jesus was the only one who could fulfill the promises of redemption for mankind. Redemption of mankind was done first by Jesus' sacrificial death, and as a, uh, which was a necessary and just payment for our sins. Then his victorious resurrection defeated them. Finally, God renewed and restored the relationship he once had with mankind as he originally did in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Because the wrath was satisfied and we are now justified forever with the Father God because Jesus Christ went to the cross for our redemption, which brought everlasting joy and peace through his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen, 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 in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good evening. We'll be speaking on... From Luke 23 verses verse 43 and it says 
today you will be with me in paradise. Father, we thank you now for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. We pray, oh God, that I decrease and that you would increase. And that the words of my mouth and the medicines in my heart will be acceptable in thy sight. We're talking about Jesus saying unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. We know that there are two types of people. There are unbelievers and there are believers. Jesus took his whole life suffering for our sins and suffering for our transgression. He came for one purpose and he came as I've been spoken for salvation and redemption unto all. But we see in this text here we're going to read back maybe from uh, verse 35 because it talks about people and two types of people. So we see here that Jesus was able to continue the work that he began even before he died for salvation. He still had power to forgive one of their sins because he was Lord. So we see in the 35th verse, it says now, And the people stood behold, and the rulers also with them, deriving him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen one. Here they're mocking him. He's on the cross. He's between two thieves. And you got these rulers that put him there, they're mocking him. In other words, they're ridiculing him. They're already trying to persecute him. And then now they're making fun of him. And then he says, the next group say, and the soldiers also mocked him, mocking him and offering him vinegar. Because Jesus said, I thirst, they offered him vinegar. You know, it's a terrible thing. You already got him on the cross. You already ridiculed him. You already persecuted him. And now you're going to mock him on the cross and make fun of him. You know, crucifixion is one of those things that you intentionally try to destroy someone's life, flesh, and power. So they was trying to take Jesus' power. And you know, in John 3, 16, they say, Now, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish. So we find here in this text, we find that he was two male factors were crucified and on the cross with Jesus. One was on the right and the other was on the left. And now he's up there on the cross and what is happening here? And it says now, and the soldiers also mocked him and offered him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of Jews, save thyself. Now they're talking to the Savior. As he's on this cross, that like he's powerless, that he has no power. You know, when, when you're in a situation and here you have been persecuted. Here you have been, he has been persecuted. He, he's been whipped. He's been mocked all his life. And he came, rejected by man, and rejected, killed, persecuted, spit on, and all the good things. Now here you saying, I am the savior of the world. I got all this power, and I can save. Now see, man in the natural, they didn't understand that. Because they feel if we get him on the cross and we kill him, We'll take his power away from him. So they saw him as weakness, but he was not weak. He was in his strength. You know, you'll find the same thing today. It's just like us. If you're trying to do the right thing, someone's going to mock you. If you're trying to walk in the right way, someone's going to mock you. You're going to make fun of it because why? Because you carry the gospel. You're trying to live for Jesus and make Jesus the center of your life and to reach the laws at any cost. So here he says, and it says, save thyself. Now you got the, and then in the 30th verse, it says, and the superscription, they wrote a scripture, also was written over him in Latin, Greek and Latin. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors which were hanging, wailing him, saying, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. 
They still being selfish. They still hadn't got it. They still trying to prove, you know, like sometimes we say, Lord, if you be the Son of God, show me a miracle. Do this for me, Lord. And all the things they have saw him did, amen, they still didn't believe. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him, amen, give sight to the blind. Because all this happened before he died. He didn't work miracles after he died. He gave that to the disciples to work. And we are his disciples today, working the work which God has called us. So now, amen, you got this one male factor. One of them on the right and one on the left. And he's also hanging right there on the cross, being nailed and crucified. And here he opened his mouth and said the same thing. He said, now, if you be the Christ, save thyself and us. Now, he had a point now. He had a point, but he had the wrong perspective. He wouldn't say, you know what? Jesus, you are the Christ. I'm guilty. Save me. Because Jesus didn't need no saving. But look at the next verse here in the 40th verse. The one thief heard all this going on, and he was on that cross right side of him. But he humbled himself. He saw what was going on. He got the message. Why? Because he was listening while the other was mocking him. While the other was criticizing him on the cross, he held his peace. He didn't open his mouth because he was listening. But all the other people, the unbelievers, was mocking him. Listen what he said. He said, but the other answer rebuked him and saying, do not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation. Other words, he stood up for Jesus. He spoke up for Jesus. He said, hey, bro, in my language, some of you have got a problem. You and I are in the same predicament. We on this cross about to be crucified. And we are being about to be condemned. And here you is running your mouth. That's what he was saying. You should be quiet and listen. So here he said, he says now, and do not thou fear God. He said, don't you fear God? Seeing that thou in the same condition. This is what he said. And he said, we indeed justly, for we receive due reward of our deed. But this man has done nothing. This man, he was confessing. He was admitting his sin. Because he said, we get just, we deserve to die and go to hell. Because we are guilty of what we have done. The reason we're on this cross is because of our sin. This man is not on the cross because of our, his sin. He's on the cross because of us and because of the rest of the world. So he's saying now, he says now, listen what he's saying. But this man had nothing and we have done nothing to do, deserve what he's getting. And in the 40th verse, he said, and he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me. Wow. He said, Lord, remember me when thou come into thy kingdom. And Jesus looked at him and said, Verily I say unto you, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. In other words, the man accepted Jesus' death and for his salvation. And Jesus spoke to him and said, this day, not tomorrow, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. In other words, he was telling the man, you're saved, and you're going to have a heavenly home with me. You know, it's never too late. It's never too late. You can be on your sick bed, and someone can come to you and present the gospel. That's why he said in his word, one day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And a thousand years with the Lord is one day. Now if you were to look at this man and you would have said, well, great God, all them sins he did and I accepted Christ a long time back. And all of a sudden this man, he on the cross, well, Jesus said, I come to save sinners. 
I didn't come to save the righteous. I come to save that was lost. He didn't say the time. He just said, do you accept me? So he said to him, this day, you will be with me in paradise. When you accept Jesus on the, for your Savior, he speaks and tells you the same thing. So we just want to say hallelujah, hallelujah, for the redemption plan that we have through Christ Jesus. God bless you. We love you. And bless you. Have a great day. God bless you. Amen. Give an honor to God. Give an honor to our pastor for giving us the opportunity to be able to be a part of the um, Jesus final saying. Give an honor to the media for making pastor look good and all of us look good. Amen. 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 We're going to be in John um, 19, um, 20. Uh, 6 to 27 and I'm going to read um, start reading at 26 when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing by he said to his mother woman behold um, your son then he said to the disciples behold your mother and from that hour the disciple took her to um took her to his own home we will bow our heads for prayer oh heavenly father precious lord our savior we just thank you we just thank you lord for this opportunity lord you have allowed us lord to participate lord on the good friday lord to speak on um jesus final words oh heaven and father lord and we just give you praise right now father we give you praise for all lord that you um are doing in our lives oh heaven and father lord we thank you lord for the ministry so, um, at saint mark oh heaven and father lord as you continue to bless and move lord through um through the ministry here at saint mark lord we will constantly give you the honor and give you the praise lord so we pray right now father lord that every word that comes forth oh heaven lord be pleasing in your sight lord and we will always give you the the honor and give you the praise. Amen. 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 So like we were saying, we are in John 19 and 26 um, and um, through 27. You know, we want to speak on being, be careful of, um, be careful who you entrust your loved ones to. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples. Out of the 12 disciples, only one was close enough um, close enough for Jesus to see. Through his pain, Jesus looked down and saw the one he referred to um, as his beloved disciple, John. John was close enough to be seen, close enough to hear Jesus. It depends on you how close you get to God. It depends on you how close you get to God. Amen? Amen. Even on the cross, Jesus is teaching, um, teaching us. It, it matters who we leave our loved ones around. Jesus, um, Jesus could have asked John to find his brothers because he was not the only child, but um, his brothers were not believers at the time. You know, if you go back to um, Mark, I mean, um, go back to Matthew twelve and four, um, and um, four, um, twelve and forty-eight, Jesus um says, but he answered and said to the one who um told him, who is um, who is my mother? Who is my brother? And on um, four, um, forty-nine, and he stretched out his hand. He stretched out his hands towards the disciples and said, Here is my mother my, and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in, the, in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Jesus' brothers, whom were, um, his mother gave birth to, were not believers at the time. And Jesus did not entrust his mother to them 
but instead to John, who was a believer. We, um, who we leave our loved ones around matter. Though G um, through Jesus' pain, he was concerned about those he loved. Sometimes painful situations will cause us to see, to not see clearly. We will leave our loved ones around anyone. But Jesus wants us to see, even through um, through the pain, we have to have a discerning spirit. Through his pain, he said, Behold your son. Through his pain, he said, Behold your mother. Through the pain, through the pain, we all have to. We all have faced painful um, situations. Some even life choices, life or death choices. But be careful who you entrust your loved ones to. If they are a believer in Christ or, or not, it matters. Behold your mother. Mother represent the bearer of life. Behold your son. Um, son represent the next generation. You know, your mother, parent, child, um, a son, ch um, your um, children. We see the cycle of life. But unfortunately, we have heard over and over um, loved ones being mistreated in the cares of, of, of those who are supposed to be taking care of them. Be careful who you entrust your loved ones um, to. If, uh, if they are not believers, we are risking the chance of putting them in harm's way. Um, where there is life, there is the next generation. Where there is life, there is, um, um, there is um, future, a future. No life, no um, next, um, next generation. Mothers, be mothers, you are um, bearers of, um, of life. Sons, you are the next generation. As, as I get to um, get um, prepared to take my seat, keep in mind, even on the cross, through all the pain, Jesus was concerned about those he loved. Um, even through the pain. Even through the pain, we need to our pain. You know, we need to think about um, having a certain spirit, always praying about um, those are around us. Be careful of those who we are um, entrust our loved ones to, that um, they um, that they will be believers in seeking the will of, of God. Amen. It matters. It matters. Amen. Amen. Good um good Friday to everyone. God bless. Good evening, everyone. Somebody just take the place tonight to talk about the fourth word that Jesus Christ said while he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Our scripture this afternoon be coming from Matthew. Chapter 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabbath, Nehemi. That is, my God, my God, wow, has thou forsaken me. And we want to talk on the subject tonight of why did Jesus cry? Let us pray. Father, we just ask that you just be with us tonight, Lord God. Just let your words, Lord, come out of me, Lord. Let self be removed. And Father, we just thank you for this opportunity. And we ask that we all be listeners to this words this evening. And Father, we just thank you once again for allowing me to be in your presence. And Lord, just be with me as we do this test. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabotini. 
my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, the journey from Gethsemane to Galpi is slightly less than one mile, less than one mile. It took six hours to complete and is the key to 2100 years of forgiveness. The journey from the garden to the cross is a journey not for the weak of heart, not for the selfish believer, and on, but only for those who can accept the mission, embrace the agony, and not only for those who are committed to completing the task. It's been six hours since Jesus was on in the garden. There he prays to his father, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. But now, during the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, Sabbathim, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? While on the cross, Jesus cried out to God, whose grace is sufficient. Jesus cried out to God, whose peace surpasses all understanding. And Jesus cried out to God, who is greater than his circumstances. I believe there are some things that only God can do. This was truly an I need you God moment. The cry was not because of the agony in the garden. The cry was not because of the betrayal near the mountain. The cry was not because of the trials in the city. The cry was not because of the denial at the camp. The cry was not for the 39 whiplashes on his back. The cry was not for the crown, the crown of thorns pressed in his head. The cry was not for the nails driven into his hands and feet. The cry was not for the sword thrusted in his side. The crowd, the cry was not because he was abandoned by his most trusted friends. And the cry was not for the insults hurled his way during his dying moments. So why do we ask? Why did he cry? Eli, Eli, lama sabothini. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? As we continue on this journey, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we find that Jesus has asked his Father to forgive them, for they know not what they do. He speaks to the thief and says, this day you will be with me in paradise. He speaks to the mother, his mother, and says, woman, behold thy son. And now he cries to the Father and says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? This is one of the most controversial phases among many theologians and is that some have concluded that Jesus spoke these words because God had abandoned him. God had deserted him and now God had turned his face from him because when God looked down from heaven, he could only see sin. But today, my brothers and sisters, I am reminded and supported of scripture Reminding us that my thoughts are not your thoughts, but neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as far as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts, higher than yours. In other words, because the mind of God is greater than ours, it challenges us to think from us deeper into the text, to seek answers as to what Jesus must have been prompted him to wonder why his father had forsaken him. I stand before you not having the answers, for I too have sought the Lord for possible reasons. I have not come face to face with the Lord in preparing this, although I conclude that too long the church has been captivated by the divinity of Christ, that we have failed to connect the humanity of Christ. On that note, how can we hold fast to the conclusion that God left him by himself? Saying that God is omnipresent, he's all powerful, and our God is omnipotent and, and all knowing. In other words, how could God the Father not know that his son was going through? How could God the Father not have the power 
in him how the power to get him out of such a situation. How could God the Father not be right there with him? If all these things were so, how could God the Father abandon himself? I say that he was never abandoned. I believe that Jesus cried out these words, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Because all out of all that he had been through, his humanity gave voice. His humanity gave voice. I mean, the human side of him began to feel the pain. We all know that Jesus is 100% God, was 100% man, and also 100% human. So at that time, the human part took over. His emotions gave way while under the pressure, so much like us today. You, have you ever cried out, my God, my God? and you felt like he didn't hear you. Have you ever decided that Jesus wasn't listening to what was going on in your life? And you felt like again, he had turned his back on you. And the second time you put a little emphasis on it and you hollered out, my God, my God. And then you think you, he's heard you and you say, where are you? Don't you see what's going, we are going through, just as we are going through this pandemic today. Many of us have said to ourselves, God, where are you during this time? Why, why are we going through this? But only God knows, not only man. We can only depend on Jesus Christ. If we will only be honest, most of us have been there. If you have not lived a little while longer, you will know to yourself. I believe that his humanity perhaps felt this way, but God did not respond. But why do you, but why do you do, but what do you do when the voice of God is silent? What do you do when you feel like you are in things all by yourself? That's a good time to stretch forth your face and trust in the Lord. This time is not a time to give up. It's not a time, to, but it's a time to look up. For I will look to the hills from which cometh my strength and my help coming from the Lord. This was a time before he uttered the last three phases and mustered up enough strength not to give in, but to persevere. But during this holy week, he compels us to draw near to God and to persevere and never give up. His child, he challenges us to continue to seek God. And even though we may not hear his voice, we have still his presence right there with us. And he's waiting for us to take a stand. So I encourage you, as I encourage myself, to cry out to God. For as we cry out to him without reservation, without shame, and without concern of the multitude, he who gives us the strength to cry out some more, but not to cry of the defeat, but rather a cry of victory. For he has heard on, he has held on, on until his mission was finished. Our tests, our trials, and our testimonies are to be designed to bring glory to his name. For again, our crying out to God as we endure our personal crucifixions, we recognize that God has not forsaken us and God has not forgotten us. How dare we forget the Lord when the Lord did not forsake us. Amen. Amen. I praise the Lord and you all have a good afternoon. Thank you, God. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Let's give God some glory. Let's give God some praise. Reach down in our belly. And praise him because he's worthy to be praised. All right now, I'm coming to you today from John, the 19th chapter, 23rd verse. And I'll be reading from John. Today I'll be talking about our thirst. Our thirst could go many ways. But let me see what he says on the 28th verse. After this, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the spirit, that the scripture might be fulfilled, and said, I thirst. Now there was set 
a vessel of full of vinegar, and they filled it a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop and put it to his mouth. John and Jesus said, I thirst. I thirst. He said, I paid the price for the sins that we we, we did, but I thirst. He said, everything was finished and the scriptures were fulfilled according to God's plan. Jesus said, I suffered bitterly amongst while I was on the cross. I was on the cross to cover God people's cover of sin and guilt and shame. I was on the cross and they pierced me in the side. I was on the cross and they put nails in my hands and they put nails in my feet and they put a crown of thrones on my head. And now I said, I thirst. I want the world to know that the enemy thought he had killed me. But I had enough of power after all the nails in my hands, in my feet, and the lashes on my back to get up and say, I thirst. And I asked for what I needed. I needed a little water so I can be more powerful when I say the next verse. Mm -hmm. But they didn't want to hear, want me to say what I needed to say. Because mm -hmm. I was the one who spoke to the woman at the well and said, if you drink from this well water, you will thirst no more. Mm -hmm. I was the one who said, for Lazarus, come forth from the grave. Yes. I was the one who said, fret not thyself over evildoers. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like green grass. Yes. I was the one who said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yes. Jesus said, they didn't want me to talk because they know who I was. Yes. They wanted me to stay thirsty because they wanted me to stay quiet. But the Lord said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandment. And it was finished on the earth. He said, look, look, look at the cross. I made, it, made them there one time. I may have been there when he did all this to me. But now I don't got up from the cross. I got power. I need a new power. All of you have power. But all the Lord that God. You got your own understanding, but love on the, on the Lord that God with all your heart. Lord have mercy. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Give us strength, Lord, from day to day. Direct us, Lord. Lord have mercy. All those crowns of thorns was on your head and you stayed there for three hours and you knew that we needed you for, the, for, our, the gift, for our sins. You knew that we needed you, Lord God, for, for our health. When we ain't going through, when we are nailed to the cross, God, we can say, Lord Jesus, help us. Help us, Lord. Help us in our sickness. Help us when we are lonely. Help us when we are depressed. Help us when the job ended. Help us, Lord, because we are nailed to the cross. But now we know that if we can, we can be free yes, through Jesus Christ, yes, our Lord and Savior, because he said, I am thirsty. Amen. They didn't kill him. Hey. I, we are not going to die. Yes. Because he said, he thirsty. Mm. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word and to the power of his spirit. And Eternal God, our Father in heaven, maker and creator of all mankind. Father, I thank you for this opportunity just to speak on your last seven words. And Father, I thank you for giving me strength to look at your scripture and see what all it had for me. 
And Father, seeing that you died on the cross and gave life to me, took away the sins of the world, Father, I just want to say thank you. And thank you, Father God, for this good Friday that you have given to us. To give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. John 19, verse 30. He said, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. I like to use for a subject this evening, the last words. It is finished. And the last word, it is finished, means it's paid in full. Paid in full. How often do we hear that? Paid in full. When we have debts to be paid, we won't always want to hear or see the sign saying it's paid in full. But you know one thing? When Jesus said it's paid in full, it made a big difference because it meant that his life was over. He gave his life for all our sins. Paul said, I have fought a good fight, and I finished my course. And see, Paul was saying that that was at the end of his journey. And I can say I have fought, I have finished my job and what I'm doing, but I have an opportunity to come back or someone to call me back and tell me my job wasn't finished. And But when Jesus said it is finished, that means it was paid in full. He didn't have to come back because all that he had gone through on the cross. You know, he went through more than any of us can imagine. Jesus went, died for our sin. He died for your sins and mine. But it didn't stop there. Sin still goes on today. After all he went through, more, no more animals can be sacrificed for our sins. Because Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sin. Animals can't be sacrificed for our sin because of the fact that they can't take away our sin. Jesus came and took away the sins of the world. And we have to say thank you, Lord, for doing this. And God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world to take on this great sacrifice for sin. Abraham and offered up his son Isaac as a human sacrifice. But you see, God made provision for Abraham. He provided a ram in the bush. John 4 and 34 say, Jesus spake of his mission here on earth to do the will of the Father that had sent him. See, we don't realize what Jesus' mission was until we think about what God wanted him to do. He was to bring us close spiritually and our mission is the same today, to go out in the hedges and highways of life and encourage people to come to Christ. Not just come to Bible study or come to church, but to come to Christ and do his will. After, after attending church, we must encourage people. And I don't mean just the ones that we know. We must encourage those that we do not know by doing God's will. John 17 and 4 say, he said, Father, I, get, I glorify thee on earth. I have finished my work, which you have gave me to do. You see, Jesus was letting his father know that he knew his time was at hand. He, and he said, Father, glory in back first five. He said, Father, glorify me that I may be able to receive my gift which you have placed for me in the kingdom. Jesus asked his father to forgive them which had whipped him all night long, which had put thorns, a crown on his head, which had pierced him in his side. Jesus wanted God to forgive them. Are we asking God to forgive those who persecute us? Are we asking God to forgive those who slander our name? Are we asking God to forgive those who we have a malice in our heart about? You got to ask God to forgive in order to be forgiven. To those who judge us, we got to realize that they have to be judged also. He whipped them, the ones who whipped them all night long. The one who carried from judgment hall to judgment hall. 
There was some gamble for his clothes. He got to think about that. But he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, in Psalm 22 says, no matter how bad situations may seem to be, we got to learn how to forgive. Uh, how evil people may be to us, we got to learn how to forgive. We talk about, we talk a good talk, but we don't fight a good fight in forgiveness. We got to learn how to open up our hearts. And when you tell someone, I forgave you for what you've done to me, make sure that your heart is clear. Forgive from your heart. Don't forgive from your head. Because we are so often forgiving from our head to just uh, in lip service. To take people for going to forgive us. When we receive, when he received the vinegar from uh, off the sponge, he said, it is finished. It means that it was all over for him. He wasn't coming back for your, to do anything for us. But he had, when he bowed his head and he said, it is, he paid it in full. We have done all we can do uh, here on earth. See, when Jesus bowed his head, like as we do when we do our prayer, we had to, got to realize that Jesus was saying something to us. And we always try to follow that pattern. When we get ready to pray, we bow our heads give an ultimate a sacrifice to God. You see, when Jesus bowed his head, and we realized he was giving up the ghost. We see that the earth, there was earthquakes all over the area. You see, darkness fell upon the earth. You see, the, the sun refused to shine. Mm -hmm. The moon dripped away in blood. Mm -hmm. The stars fell from the silver sockets. Mm -hmm. The holy and the holy of the holies, they couldn't tow from the top to the bottom. We got to realize what power God had in his son Jesus. See, he did all that to let us know that something very precious had been taken away from him. His son was, he said, this is my son which is hanging on the cross. This is my son which is hanging on the cross. Then Jesus gave up the ghost. It is finished. I can imagine in my little mind, him God saying, that's my son because on Friday, afternoon. He gave up the ghost. But I'm here to tell you now, Sunday is still coming. We may realize when Friday is here that we think it's all over, but Sunday is still coming. And when Jesus came back, he said, Father, I thank you for your sacrifice. Father, I thank you for allowing me to have that body to go down in Yonah's world for 33 years. Father, I tried my best to do your will. And Father, while I was doing your will, Father, I run into some stumbling blocks. But Father, I didn't allow those stumbling blocks to keep me from doing your will. Father, I raised my head and gave you praise, glory, and honor for all the stumbling blocks that was in my way. Father, I just want to thank you on this good Friday. Thank you, Father, for what you have done. Thank you for what you're doing in my life right now. Father, I just thank you for your son, Jesus, who came and gave me an opportunity to give you praise, glory, and honor for all you have done and for what you're doing right now. Father, I just thank you for letting me be a vessel here at St. Mark to be able to call and give your people a little bit of hope, telling them that, thus says the Lord, that the ways of sin is still there, but the gift of God is eternal life. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, to whom all blessings flow, we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 46. And the text reads, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, until your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And I want to preach tonight uh, on the subject, Father, take care of me. Father, take care of me. Uh, my brothers and sisters, I, 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 I'm going to admit to you that I don't mind being vulnerable 
uh, that this seventh altering of Christ from the text made me confused and complex. That I, I really thought, uh, Deacon Curtis, that things could have ended on the sixth word. <laughs> so, so my question is, uh, uh, and I'm struggling uh, with tonight, why didn't Jesus just die? Why, why, why didn't he just die? My beloved, we have already heard it said from Reverend Richmond, it is finished. The text tells us that it was dark from the sixth to the ninth hour. All right. Because all creations from morning, the death of the Lamb of God, the veil of the temple was torn in two. Letting, know, letting us know that Jesus' assignment was completed. His work was done. Hebrews let us know that the temple veil, the, the SS was free and clear, and now for all Reverend Gunn to come to God. This was symbolic that, uh, to what uh, Timothy said, that there was one God, one mediator between God and men. And that is the man, Jesus the Christ. My beloved, all I'm trying to tell you tonight is he finished his work. He completed his assignment, so why didn't he just die? He altered uh, this word, and I believe Jesus was modeling something very critical for us. Oh, as Jesus say, Father, until your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus is letting us know that we must finish the work. But we need not, Reverend Cook, to be more concerned about the work than the one that does the work. Oh, praise his holy name. For the worker is important to God. You don't need to need me to tell you that there are some people in your life, all they want to know is you're going to finish the assignment. They won't want you to take care of the job, but they are not trying to take care of you. Oh, are you praying with me? Oh, I'm so glad that Jesus took time to model for us his need to not only take care of his assignment, but also take care of us. Oh, many of our prayers are, Jesus, I do what you ask me to do, but I need you. Need you to take care of me. Oh, oh Reverend Jenkins, the word for somebody tonight is consider the, consider the condition of your spirit. My beloved, don't you dare keep coming to church. Don't you sing in the choir. Don't you stand behind your secret desk for years and years and never take care of your spirit. Mm. Oh, you need to make a decision while you are here about what is going to happen with your spirit when you leave. You can sing all the songs you want to sing, dance all you can, pray all the prayers, but if you don't secure your spirit in eternity, in your faith in Jesus Christ, all of it will be for naught. Yeah. And preach us. We got to bring truth with the word when we preach. Because we are responsible for the souls of the people who we are preaching to. You got to take care of your spirit. And don't you realize that uh, this was Jesus' motto. You, you, you remember, uh, Reverend Goodman, you remember him throughout the gospel. He was always taking care of his spirit. How many times after he prayed, after he laid hands, after he fed thousands, that he go away uh, with his father so that he could feed his spirit? So Jesus was doing Deacon Curtis two things. He was taking, he was talking about us taking care of our spirit right now, tonight. Because if you don't take care of your spirit, you can't have service without 
sincerity. Oh, my God. If you don't take care of your spirit, you will have works without worship. Mm. Oh, if you don't take care of your spirit, Reverend Cook, you can't have completion of assignment without fully appreciating fully what you do for Christ is going to last. <laughs> There is tension between meeting and ministry. And my beloved, I'm going to let you know I got a problem with people who can make it to choir rehearsal meeting but can't even find you in the place where you're supposed to have your spirit fed. Oh, you, you got to consider the condition of your spirit. For our spirit is the essence to who we are. And you can do all these, uh, this other stuff, but don't neglect your spirit, I tell you. Oh, what is going on? What is it going to prosper a man to gain the entire world and yet lose track of his soul? <laughs> but you see, my brothers, and my sisters, Jesus, he didn't put his spirit just anywhere. When Jesus uttered this thought, he helps us model this understanding that the worker is just important as the work. He didn't just leave his spirit laying around. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Oh, my beloved, this is, this is really a prayer. This is a repeat of Psalms 31 and 5. And it was a prayer that the Jewish mother taught their children. It was something they said before they went to sleep at night. So really, Jesus was just saying, hold up. Hold up to this for, hold up to this for a moment. And you do understand, Deacon Curtis, it was only going to be for just a moment. Because he was coming back again. But let me tell you about where Jesus put his spirit. He put it in the hands of God because he knew that the hands of God were safekeeping. It was a good place to deposit it. And this brings me to the first one of the text tonight. They are secure hands. <laughs> John 10, 29 says, look that his sheep are secure at the hands of his father because his father is greater than all and no one is able to pluck them out of his hands. So, so now when you're in the hands of God, you're in a secure place. God will hold on to you. God won't lose track of you. Other people might ignore you and forget you, but if you're in the hands of God, God will always have his eyes on you. Oh, well, Deacon Curtis just brings me to the second point of the text. Not only are the hands of God secure, but secondly, they are sufficient hands. <laughs> My beloved, Psalms 94, 3 and 4 says that the Lord is a great God and his hands are, are the deep places of the earth. The strength of, his, of the hills also is his. So, so, so now I want you to know that God's hands are deep scores to give you whatever you need. Yeah, sufficient for whatever you might lack. If you need peace, he has some, some sufficient peace. If you need protection, he has sufficient protection. If you need love, grace, strength, wisdom, power to just make it through, the hands of God are sufficient hands. Oh, that's why you will want to be in the hands of God. 
<laughs> Not the hands of Pastor McCoy. Not the hands of Robin Cook, Robin Goodman, Robin Jenkins. Oh, not your husband's hands, not your wife's hands, not your job hands, not your children's hands, but the hands of God. Amen. And this brings me to the third and final point of the text. Not only the hands of God are secure hands, not only they are sufficient hands, but thirdly, they are sovereign hands. <laughs> My beloved, First Chronicles 29 and 11 and 12 says, Thy own Lord is the, uh, the greatness, the power and glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. There is the kingdom, O oh Lord, and you are uh, exalted as the head of all. Both riches and honor comes from you, and you reign over all. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Brother Squawwell, well, here it is. In, in your hands is power and might. In your hands it is to make great and give strength to all. So God's hands are sovereign hands. So you don't have to worry about what man might do in your, in your, in his hands. You know the sovereign God of the universe will take care of you. Jesus knew it. That's why when he needed somebody to, to hold something, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He said, Father, you can hold on to me. You know and you have all that I need. Well, where am I, beloved? I got to get out of here now, but uh, I want you to know you need to put yourself into the hands of God. If you never accepted God, don't leave tonight. Yeah, don't leave tonight. I'll cut off your phones watching us preach tonight without thinking your work or your service is going to be enough. Oh, you must be born again. You must believe and put yourself into the hands of God, I tell you. And then once you are in the hands of God, don't, don't you know you can put everything else into the hands of God? Take my seat, but uh, all in his hands. I put all in his hands. Whatever the problem is, whatever the struggle is, whatever the sickness is, I put it all in his hands. I tell you, I know he can solve them. Put it all in his hands. This and that. This, this, this and that. I tell you. I put it all in his hands. He can have it all, I tell ya. Oh, that's a fact. No matter how great or small he it is, he's the master of them all, I tell you tonight. <laughs> that's why I put all, yeah, yeah, all, all, yes, yes, yes. I put all in his hands, his secure hands, his strong hands. His sovereign hands, his sufficient hands, I put it all in his hands. Father, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. God bless you. God bless you tonight. Whatever it is, put it in God's hands. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Put it in his hands. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he died and he got up, then you shall be saved. And you will inherit eternal life. So don't turn this television off tonight. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it until you accept the Lord Jesus Christ.
Yes, I tell you. Yes, sir. God bless you.